Um, so thanks everyone for the opportunity to talk with you today. I'm really interested to hear about the work of CCL and based on Rod's introduction there, it sounds like there's some very important work going on and some very interesting advances in the conversations that you're having. So congratulations on that work. And um, I hope that this um, introduction to our work is helpful and maybe it will provide an opportunity for us to find some um, uh, opportunities to collaborate in the work that we're doing. So uh, as Rod said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the Human Health and Wellbeing Climate Adaptation Plan for Queensland, very wordy document, um, very wordy title, um, and a little bit about the background to the development of that plan. So developed um, together with the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility, so a network that's existed for many years, um, a shadow of its former self, having had considerable amount of funding stripped away from it. Um, in fact, the lead for NCARF um, had to leave NCARF during, because due to a lack of funding and um, do the work as a consultant for NCARF during the course of our project, which is, you know, says something about their um, secure, you know, financial security. Nonetheless, they are an important organisation and um, it was really great to partner with them and to have the opportunity to do it. Um, the reason that we were asked by the Queensland Government to do this work is because um, of work that we've been doing at Climate and Health Alliance over several years, um, developing policy ideas and encouraging policymakers and decision makers to consider the health impacts of climate change and the opportunities to improve health and well-being from strategies to reduce emissions. So that work over the last couple of years has taken the form of developing a framework for a national strategy on climate health and well-being for Australia. So there's a couple of kind of um, underpinning um, documents that have um, led to this and informed this. I guess back in 2012, we led the development of what was called the Doha Declaration on Climate Health and Wellbeing. So that's a global declaration that was issued by health and medical organisations at the Doha Global Climate Talks in 2012. And the framing about health and well-being was a very important one and, um, and was considered very important by health stakeholders that we're not only calling for protection of health, but the broader kind of concept of health health. So no, we're not just talking about the avoidance of illness, but the, the framing was very much directed towards the opportunity for human flourishing in well-being. Um, so that's something that's informed the framework that we have developed. We um, undertook a project in 2015, uh, which was to do the first ever global survey on national climate and health plans. So in the lead up to the Paris Climate Talks, we wanted to, um, as we have in, in many other years, um, as part of health delegations, worked hard to get health on the agenda at the Global Climate Talks and at the COP. Um, and in order to do that, we uh, led a project that was um, auspiced by the World Federation of Public Health Associations in 2015. So looking at what nations are doing on climate change and health. Um, now, a couple of reasons for doing that. One, to underpin our advocacy at the COP. Um, another, to help to answer the question for people um, as to exactly what is climate and health policy? What are nations doing in relation to that? And also to be able to, to point to the gaps um, in what is happening uh, so that we can advocate for that to be addressed. So we were not really surprised to find that the, the outcome of that report that Australia lags behind comparable countries in addressing the health impacts of climate change and taking steps to implement policies that will protect health uh, from climate change. So uh, that led to a proposal for a national strategy on climate health and well-being. So the outcome at the global, at the Paris Climate Talks, where 
health was uh, recognized as central to the rationale for climate action. And the Paris Agreement now includes an obligation for parties to that agreement to consider its citizens' right to health in the context of climate policy. So that means that parties to that agreement, and Australia as it has ratified and now signed that agreement, that means that we have an obligation uh, to that international agreement to consider health in our climate policy decisions. So our argument is that without an, a mechanism or a strategy or a process to do that, that we will fail, that Australia will fail in that international obligation. So we've been working with the health sector since late in 2015, following the signing of that agreement, um, to begin a discussion about what a national public policy response would look like and what the priorities and concerns were of the health sector in terms of what they want to see happen. Um, we led a consultation that, um, as I said, um, began 2015 and um, took uh, the form of a national survey um, with healthcare stakeholders. We had many face-to-face uh, -face forums in several states. We had an online discussion forum using a platform called Pax Republic, uh, which was a fantastic way of of essentially holding a kind of nine day conference online where people could come in and out and participate in the discussion. And we had uh, national and international experts on climate and health research and policy, part of that conversation so that people could come in, share their ideas, respond to others and ask questions. Um, we held a health leaders round table in Canberra where we took the CEOs and presidents of many health organizations to Canberra to enable them to share their concerns with representatives from the major parties. So it was quite an unprecedented collaboration across the health sector around climate and health policy. And it led to the development of a framework for a national strategy on climate, health and wellbeing for Australia. So I won't go into the detail of that so much today, but um, suffice to say that it, it exists. Um, it's a world first. It's um, being viewed with a lot of interest around the world. Um, I've recently been in California talking at the Global Climate and Health Forum um, at a health action roundtable with representatives from World Health Organization and United Nations Development Program, as well as um, philanthropy and the World Bank, um, looking at it as an example for other nations to follow in developing their national responses on climate change and health. So that work that we had done um, and the insights that we gathered um, from our consultation with the health sector was the reason that the Queensland Government um, Department of Environment and Science approached us to ask us if we would develop a um, climate adaptation plan for the health sector in Queensland. So just to speak um, quickly to one of the other things on this slide about the global green and healthy hospitals. So as well as the work that we do around uh, research, um, advocacy and communications on climate change and health, we also work with the health sector to help them reduce their environmental footprint and carbon footprint and help accelerate a best practice in low carbon operations. So that um, project is um, the way that we deliver that is through coordinating the Global Green and Healthy Hospitals Network in Australia and New Zealand. We have about um, 47 members, I think, health system members represent, and that represents um, around 900 hospitals and health services across Australia and New Zealand. So they have access to this uh, virtual community globally, uh, to tools and resources and guidance documents and experts, and that allows them to uh, learn from one another. They contribute case studies um, on a whole range of different areas from energy, waste, water, buildings, transport, uh, food, pharmaceuticals, chemicals. Um, anyway, you get the idea. Wow. So that's, that's a little bit about our work and, um, and the background to uh, the opportunity that we had to work with the Queensland Government. Uh, this is just some slides from the launch of our national framework in Parliament House in Canberra last year. And as you can see, representatives from both the government, the opposition and the Greens. So quite unprecedented to get um, all of those people together in the same room on climate change, much less um, 
agreeing that the work that was um, being discussed was very important and um, you know strong support from Minister Ken Wyatt the Minister for Aged Care and Indigenous Health um, support from the Greens which rather less surprising um, but the announcement immediately after this launch from Catherine King the Shadow Minister for Health and Mark Butler the Shadow Minister for Climate Change announcing that if elected to government that the ALP will develop a national plan on climate health and wellbeing for Australia based on the framework that we have developed. So we we'll are continue to work inside and outside parliament to, um, to help that to happen. Uh, so I just mentioned that the, the, the national strategy as well as the Queensland plan were shared um, on a global stage at the Global Climate Action Summit in California. We actually had the situation where on, um, on the Tuesday of, of one week, we had the uh, Queensland Minister for Health, Stephen Miles, launching the, the um, Human Health and Wellbeing Climate Plan for Queensland in Brisbane. And on the following day, uh, Leanne Enoch, the Minister for the Environment, talking about it <coughs> at the Global Climate and Health Forum in California. So um, the, the Human Health and Wellbeing Climate Adaptation Plan, we were asked by the government to develop a plan that addressed um, three um, particular constituencies. That was the health sector, um, those in aged care, and also in childcare. So looking at all um, kind of um, ages across the spectrum and um, looking at ways in which those services can prepare themselves for climate change, um, better adapt so that they can continue to deliver services in a climate change future. So we conducted um, consultations across Queensland with workshops in Brisbane, Toowoomba and in Cairns. Um, what we heard from those people was um, remarkably consistent. Uh, they, um, people said they felt that the health services were very vulnerable from climate change, that increasing demand associated with climate impacts um, meant that there were surges that threatened the capacity of services, um, health services and aged care services to meet demand and to continue to provide safe and quality care, particularly when it's needed most. One of the other major challenges that they find in terms of responding to the impacts of climate change is that there is no authorising environment. So without policy and guidance for them, it makes it very hard to prioritise climate change adaptation when they're already stretched. And, um, and we all know, um, you know, the demands and the burdens on the health sector, they are very immediate. Uh, the doors are always open. There's never an opportunity in health services to stop to sit and reflect. It's a continuous 24 hour a day, 365 days of the year service. So, um, you know, it's um, very important to get climate change embedded in their operations, but without that policy guidance, um, that's difficult for them to prioritize. What we also heard, however, though, that there's a very strong commitment and appetite from the sector, and that's across health and aged care and childcare. We had really strong participation from network leaders in the region and they all have a very strong interest in helping to reduce their carbon footprint and emissions, um, recognising that there's lots of opportunities from new generation technologies. They also recognise that there are opportunities and co-benefits from responding to climate change, both in terms of adaptation and mitigation, that it will strengthen the resilience of the sector that it will bring benefits to health and, um, and well-being for the community, and that there are financial opportunities, that the, there's an opportunity to reduce costs associated with service delivery um, by investing in prevention um, in the community and in, and in resilience. So um, yes, um, good, really good engagement from people um, across um, each of those sites and some really valuable insights from them about the way to move forward. In terms of what their main concerns were around the impacts of climate change and health and well-being, what we heard from them is that um, there's a significant concern about heat stress um, in terms of changes to patterns of infectious and vector-borne diseases was a very high level of concern, as was deaths and injuries associated with extreme weather events. 
mental health issues and the emotional and social distress, both associated with climate change and so itself, as well as the failure to act on climate change is something that people were, were telling us about. Mm -hmm. um, there's a high level of concern about the vulnerability of certain groups and recognising that existing inequalities exacerbate the impacts of climate change and on people's ability to ad adapt and respond. That um, issues like housing, housing, transport, people's livelihood and employment and their, um, and e their ecological environment um, impact on um, the way climate change influences them. Food and water and, and um, water safety and security were really high um, important themes that came out of discussions as well, as well as the um, uh, increase in existing illnesses that's related to climate change impacts. So cardiovascular and respiratory disease associated with air pollution, which is caused by um, the same pathways that um, b burning fossil fuels also contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and impacts on children's health and development was a really important theme, not just from um, the stakeholders in, in um, childcare, but across the other sectors as well. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, there was a concern about their ability to continue to provide safe, um, high quality services. Um, the, that there's an increasing pressure that people are already feeling that the pressure on services in relation to climate change. That damage to infrastructure and the costs associated with that and interruptions for, um, to supply um, of electricity, um, of um, service provision, uh, to supply chains was something that has an impact on uh, their ability to um, deliver services. That a lack of leadership at the senior executive level to manage climate risk um, is a barrier to taking action. And something that we observed and heard from people is that there's fairly limited um, evaluation of climate risk assessment across each of those services. The lack of um, guidance in terms of policy and regulation, as well as financing, um, is a barrier for them to build capacity, um, both to mitigate and to adapt. And rising utility costs are pushing up the cost of service provision. Um, other barriers to adaptation come under the um, air sort of topics of governance. So a lack of clarity and on roles and responsibilities at different levels of government. This was something that came up time and time again, a great sense of frustration about the lack of cooperation of integrated responses and of the unwillingness of governments to lead a lack of coordination across um, different levels of government as well. That, that means that there's a lack of clarity around um, their ability to make decisions um, and that the response of um, health services um, in relation to climate change in terms of policy guidance is generally in terms of a focus on disaster recovery. So that really limits their ability to plan ahead and to um, embed um, changes in their operations that help them develop climate resilience for the longer term. A lack of data at local and regional scales, so pointing to the importance of research, makes it difficult for them to um, both to advocate for resources to to respond and also to understand and anticipate what the impacts are going to be on local communities that they need to prepare for. Um, the, the lack of policy and lack of access to funding and also the way in which um, budgets are um, developed in um, healthcare services in terms of the siloing of capital and operational budgets. So a really strong desire among many stakeholders to invest in renewables and be installing solar, but not able to realize um, because of the um, separation of capital and operational budgets, the savings that would be realized in the operations, um, not necessarily appreciated um, in the, the um, capital budget area and therefore access to that um, upfront investment is difficult. And there was um, psychosocial barriers. So the um, uh, lack of understanding about the risks that people that we that the community faces from climate change and um, often that responses um, 
uh, focused on what individuals can do rather than building capacity and building opportunities for collaboration. So uh, that was something that came out as a strong theme that people would like to have um, more enablers available to them to collaborate um, both across the sector but also with other um, partners as well. So um, also highlighting that people's lack of understanding that climate change is a serious problem that must be addressed is another um, obvious and significant barrier to um, getting to support to act. Some of the opportunities and co-benefits that people identified from climate action were that there would be um, opportunities to boost community resilience and, and well-being, but also that there are financial benefits. So things like better design standards that lead to more comfortable and climate resilient buildings, um, uh, climate resilient infrastructure, um, better access to um, public and urban spaces that are um, provide opportunities for cooling and the um, improved air quality from investing in renewables that, um, and cleaner energy and transport, the, the health benefits that that will bring was something that was recognised as a, a important benefits. And also the cost savings that come from energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, and that, you know, many people pointing to the importance of investing in, in um, climate responses because of the huge costs that we're seeing associated with um, impacts on buildings and infrastructure um, following extreme weather events. It was a recognition that many of the um, strategies that we can implement to tackle climate change are no regrets and win-win outcomes, um, but the simplistic kind of economic business case, it doesn't take into account the health um, costs associated with um, inaction on climate change and also associated with fossil fuels means that the um, business cases are often distort distorted and, um, and are inadequate for um, the um, really making the case for action. Mm. There was a strong recognition of the health co-benefits associated from an, a healthy and natural environment. So um, clean air, soil and water, but also looking at the ways in which we can improve urban environments to improve health and well-being, and also reduce um, emissions. Community engagement um, was a theme that came up again and again. So uh, people recognizing that in order to develop effective responses that we need to invest in community engagement. And so working with communities, um, raising awareness about the impacts of climate change, but working with communities to design solutions was something that was considered very important in terms of effective responses. Um, so, you know, some of the pathways to respond are around addressing that uncertainty at the, po um, at the political level and um, addressing the policy uncertainty. So, you know, continually versus cynicism about the lack of government commitment to climate adaptation and pointing to the importance for um, both public and private sector services of um, consistent and science-based plans and guidance um, both at the local, you know, at all levels, national, state, regional and local as an enabler for these services to invest in responses. Health impact assessment was something that was pointed to in terms of, you know, making informing decisions about new projects um, and also highlighting that risk assessment and understanding their le the legal responsibilities around climate action um, was um, something that would be an effective enabler. We had lots of conversations with people about the Hutley legal opinion. I'm not sure if um, people in CCL have been talking about that a great deal, but it's a um, legal opinion that was commissioned by the Centre for Policy Development and the Future Business Council back in 2016. And Noel Hutley QC was asked to provide an opinion on the um, legal liability for directors of companies Australia constituted under Australian corporations law in relation to evaluating climate risk. And there was a very um, definitive um, opinion um, from Noel Hutley, which basically said that directors of companies who fail to account for climate change in their strategic and operational plans could be found personally liable in a court. So that um, 
that opinion is um, having an impact on the business sector. Um, we and others are working with the Centre for Policy Development to develop a clearer understanding about what the implications are for the public sector, um, given that we work you know, largely with the health sector where many of those services are in the public realm. So there's actually a, a round table coming up in Melbourne to look at that um, later this month. But uh, we did um, make sure that when we were talking to stakeholders in Queensland from these sectors, that they were aware of that opinion and that they needed to be taking this into account. Um, so building system capacity is obviously very important. So um, there's a recognition that, you know, there's a lot of work to do in terms of workforce development, that health professionals and workers in those other sectors are not necessarily receiving training about climate change and that limits their ability to um, predict the impacts and to, um, to um, educate others and to um, contribute to efforts to be um, climate resilient. Um, so the um, 10 priority adaptation measures that we developed were really sought to emphasise as a priority the need for leadership and governance at all levels of government. Um, that there's an, it's vital to build the preparedness and the capacity of the sector and the community to uh, respond to climate and health threats and that there are many ways of doing that. So, um, you know, preparing case studies is one way, um, bringing people together um, in the way that we did to develop the Queensland plan um, by collaborating and, and consulting with stakeholders to help them develop plans is an important way to buy, buy um, get buy into the solution, but also to raise awareness and to build those um, net communities of practice for people to respond. Obviously, there's important um, public health measures to address the, um, you know, what are essentially preventable climate change illnesses, injuries and deaths um, through mitigation and effective adaptation. We are encouraging all of those services to be investing in assessing and managing their risk and highlighting the risk of liability so that... Um, um, and the importance of embedding uh, climate risk in their strategic and operational plans. Also research data and evaluation, obviously incredibly important to underpin decision-making. And there's a massive gap in climate and health research in Australia. That's another sort of theme of work that we um, have been working on, trying to get the Medical Research Future Fund to um, uh, place more emphasis on this as an issue. I mean, the Lancet, the International Medical Journal has said climate change is the biggest threat to global public health this century. And and yet less than, um, I think it's 0.2% of the health and medical research budget goes towards research in this area. So um, we've got extraordinary researchers working on this topic in Australia, but there's um, very little money to do the work that, um, that we need to do. So economics and financing obviously needs to be prioritised and we need to invest in, in um, adaptation and mitigation. Um, that, you know, uh, make the, another priority adaptation measure around collaboration, so recognising that more effective responses can be developed when there is collaboration across sectors. And this is something that we also highlighted in the national framework because um, it, we're not um, encouraging that to be simply the responsibility of the health portfolio, recognising that the um, um, underpinnings and drivers of health actually arise outside of the health sector. So the national framework has obligations in the energy, transport, buildings and agriculture sector. And um, we also, you know, we're highlighting that in this plan that there is a need to work across sectors, but also to work um, with different stakeholder groups and with communities. Education and communication, obviously a huge area um, and something that, um, that you are obviously contributing to at CCL. Policy regulation and, in, in, um, uh, and legislation to provide certainty, really important, and investing in climate resilient infrastructure and technology to, um, to underpin all of those other things. So, I mean, that's a very brief overview, I guess, of the architecture of the plan, and I'm happy mm. to talk more about um, some of the 
conversations that we had, you know, where we hope that this will go and some of the work that we hope to do to support its further implementation. Um, it, it was an opportunity to begin really important conversations in these sectors. Many of these stakeholders never been brought together to have an opportunity to think strategically about climate change and what it means for their services. Um, you know, haven't had that opportunity to engage with others. Um, so, you know, we, we hope that there is the beginnings of a community of practice there to continue to do that. Um, you know, obviously, the point that prevention is better and cheaper than cure, the old um, maxim from the health sector applies to this issue in terms of tackling climate change. We really would like to continue to work to highlight to governments and others the co-benefits that arise from strategies that both tackle climate change and reduce emissions and deliver health benefits at the same time, but they need to be designed to do that in order to maximise those benefits from integrated policy. Um, and, you know, this plan provides the starting point. It's, um, there's, there's a lot more to do. Uh, we would like to see a much stronger emphasis on, on mitigation. The um, brief that we had was really to develop a plan that falls under the architecture of the climate, uh, Queensland climate adaptation strategy. So there were the limitations in that um, space, but we're really pleased to have had the opportunity to make this contribution. We think that it is an important starting point and um, we're pleased to see, you know, that there is support from the Minister and, um, and, and from the Department to getting on with further work. So I can talk a little bit more about that if you would like, but I'll well, stop there. Thank you, Fiona. I think it's, you've done more than a made a start. I think it sounds like um, the process that you went through was very comprehensive and, and very powerful and I, and I guess has, has already had a, quite a significant effect on, on the internal workings of, of the health systems and the awareness raising that would have come, come about as part of that process would have been very significant I think and um, and so and that that was shown that sort of was shown in the in the launch that I saw it, it, it could it, we could see that there was quite a lot behind it so um, so thanks very much for that I'll, I'll um, I'll now throw it open to, to questions. Um, um, we've got time for a couple, two or three questions, I should think. If anyone wants to ask a question, don't forget to unmute. And Dash, Dashni, you're ready by the look of it. Yep. Um, thank you, Fiona. That was fantastic. Um, uh, my name's Dashni. I'm part of Doctors of the Environment as well as CCL. Um, I, yep, I was wondering um, two things. Um, first of all, um, when you're talking to the far right parts of the politicians, uh, which parts of the, of the climate change and health message do you find has the most bite as far as lobbying goes? Um, because, I mean, it's easy talking to the Greens and it's easy talking to a lot of Labour, but um, not so much the National Party. Um, so I was just wondering what you thought as far as your um, experience. And the second thing was kind of like this point and like that, for example, haven't come out strongly about this. And I was wondering whether you have more insight as to whether they're moving to, um, you know, be out in the public saying that this is an important health um, problem. Can you just repeat the second part of your question, Dash, because you disappeared. So I heard the question about how do you talk to far-right politicians and then the second bit got lost. I, I also find it quite disappointing that the AMA and um, a lot of the colleges don't come out strongly um, about climate change and health. And I was just wondering whether you have found uh, that there's some movement with that or how do we help that movement to happen? <coughs> yeah. Okay, um, so to, to talk to the first point, we actually haven't done a lot of kind of individual lobbying around this plan. We haven't got had the capacity to do that. And what we have chosen to do is to really kind of be mobilising uh, the health sector at scale and getting them in front of and talking with politicians who are willing to take action. So, you know, the, it's been the kind of open doors policy really, and particularly having had a very quick and very positive response from the ALP. I mean, our, 
um, our, our campaign strategy around the launch of the framework last year was really like we had a about a year that we thought it would take to get one of the major political parties to make a commitment. So that happened on the day of the launch. So that sort of took us a bit by surprise. Um, I was in, then able to take um, two months leave and go on sabbatical. But um, obviously the work to do now is to, get, is to hold them to that. It is difficult to work with the government. I mean, you know, we've all seen what's happened in terms of trying to get the neg um, through. And, you know, at, at this point, um, the health minister is still continuing to refuse to meet with us about it. We're trying to organise a meeting with him through a local constituent to kind of get this in front of him. But he's, been, he's done a very good job of refusing to um, participate. Um, so, you know, we're, we're working now with the ALP to um, make sure that they hold good on their promise. Uh, they've got their national conference coming up. The commitment to the national strategy is part of their policy platform that they published several months ago. There's obviously more to do in terms of... Um, you know, how they proceed. They are saying, you know, like they do on every issue that they don't have the ability to really develop comprehensive policy in opposition. So the best that they can do is to continue to maintain that commitment. Um, so we're working on trying to find things that they can weave into um, policy announcements that are part of the framework that aren't necessarily have a huge cost implication so that we can start to get um, some commitments to that. But, you know, we continue to work across, um, you know, all parts of the parliament. So um, we're just beginning or um, reinvigorating a, a, a project that we had last year to train climate health champions and to encourage people to meet with their MP and have them sign a pledge to commit to supporting the further development and implement, implementation of the framework. So it's our goal that we get somebody in every federal electorate who are, uh, is a health professional who's regularly meeting with their MP to be having this conversation, to be helping to re-educate um, parliamentarians so that um, they can begin to advocate internally to help shift those party positions. Um, in terms of uh, the medical colleges, we did have very strong support from all, you know, many of the medical colleges, I wouldn't say all, but, um, but certainly many in the development of the national framework. So the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, the Royal um, Australasian College of General Practitioners, the Australian College of Emergency Medicine and the AMA were all involved in those meetings with health leaders, um, with the parliamentarians. So the, um, all of those colleges, except for the AMA, have um, publicly endorsed the framework and included their logos on the framework. So I think that that's a fairly strong public um, recognition and um, of, of support. They continue to use the framework in their advocacy and we're working with all of those stakeholders who've signed on to the framework already to include commitments to um, the framework as part of their federal election platform in the lead up to the um, the next federal election, asking them to be talking to their constituents and members about the importance of the framework, publicly declaring that they support it and they want to see um, they want to see it further developed. Um, in terms of the AMA, we've actually got an announcement in the coming up on Monday in one of the candidates in the seat of Wentworth is going to announce a um, commitment to a national strategy on climate health and wellbeing. And uh, because the AMA have a, a, a position, um, I think inspired by our work um, in which their position statement calls for a national plan on health and climate change, we invited them to, you know, um, put out a supportive press release as well. But they, they, they just don't tend to publicly cooperate with others. They like to run their own race. So, you know, whilst they work um, with us and have, you know, made important contributions and supported us a lot, actually, in the development of the framework, uh, they don't tend to do that publicly. So, um, you know, we just continue to work on a kind of parallel track with them and um, in the knowledge that the more that we move forward, the more we drag them with us because they don't like to be left behind. So, you know, we're comfortable with that as a strategy. Thank you, Fiona, for that. And um, I'm afraid we're nearly out of time. So I'll just ask the last question, which is really important, and that is um, 
as, as, as you've heard, we, we try to meet with members of parliament as, as often as we can. And, um, and my member ha happens to be Ken Wyatt. So I'm really pleased to hear that he's been, um, been active and um, we'll, we'll follow, follow up on that. Yes, but, um, do. Yes. But I guess the key question is, um, what message would you like us to be taking to, to, um, to our MPs um, when we're meeting? Um, yeah, great. Well, look, I mean, if you, um, the, the, the framework's online, if you want to um, download it or take bits of it with you to the meeting and encourage them to um, sign up to support it. But I mean, to make it simple, there's a, a pledge available on our, our Climate, Our Health website, which I can circulate, um, which is what we've been taking and having people in our network take when they meet with their MP or senator and people are using that, whether they're meeting at the jurisdictional level with states and territories and at the federal level, it just basically asks them to sign that they acknowledge that climate change is an important health issue, that we must have policies to respond and that they will work, they will support the a development of a, a national strategy on climate health and wellbeing and will advocate in the parliament for its further development. So we're working with the health ministers at the states, state and territory level to try and get them to sponsor a conversation about the national strategy at the COAG Health Council meeting. Uh, we're confident that we've got a number of them who are willing to do that. So. I mean, Greg Hunt has the ability to remove it from the agenda, even if the states and territories want it there. But if that was the case, you know, that in itself will be, um, you know, a reason to kind of make a bit of noise about it. But we think that that's an important enabler for, um, our, you know, a, a future federal government that um, who may wish to develop the national strategy if they know that the, the states and territories are on board and that they are also pushing for it. Um, that that will be helpful. So yeah, happy to share those pledges and um, links to the framework if that's helpful. Great, yes, that'll be wonderful. And I'll circulate them as soon as I get them. Um, so um, 